When the Buddha came to his knowledge, sect of knowledge on the night of his awakening, it answered an important question. He had seen in his first knowledge that death was followed by rebirth and that people can change. Some people back in his time had claimed that whatever you were in this lifetime, you would be in the next lifetime. Animals would continue being animals, people, people, Brahmins, Brahmins. But he had seen that he changed, going from the highest to the lowest and the lowest to the highest levels of the cosmos. And the question that came was, what determined the changes? And the second knowledge you realized it was your actions. But he remembered why he had come to this knowledge, because many other people on arriving there got interested in the question of well, what is it that stays the same? Who is it that gets reborn? And they got stuck right there. He realized that the way out was to look at the actions. And he looked very carefully. As he said later, he knew of people who had seen that someone did good in a particular lifetime and then they were born in a good place. Others did bad and they were born in a bad place. So he came up with a very deterministic view that whatever you did was going to determine where you were going to go the next lifetime. But there had also been other people who had seen the opposite. Someone did something really good in this lifetime that they had seen, but then they saw them go to a bad place and vice versa. Those are the people who said that action had no power at all. So who was right? He had to look more carefully. And he noticed that in the cases where someone did bad and then went to a good location, it's because either they had good karma prior to that, or good karma after that, or at the moment of death, they developed right view. The same with the opposite. Someone who had done good may have had a bad karma in the past, but had come after that or developed a wrong view of death, and so they went to a bad destination. But even in the cases where people did good, they went to a good destination, just the one act was not enough. It had to be supported by other good acts and right view at death. The same with people who had done something bad, went to a bad destination, it had to be seconded by that wrong view continued at death. That showed him the power of present actions, that one moment of death, the attitude of the mind, could counteract a lot of other things. It wouldn't erase them. The moment of right view does not erase bad things you've done in the past, but it can help you avoid some of the consequences of bad things opens the opportunity for you to practice. So you can be like Angulimala, finally gain an escape from your past bad karma through your practice. So that's what inspired him to look into the present moment in his third knowledge. What is it about choices made in the present moment that have such power? This is why we're looking at the present moment right now. Of course, for a lot of us it does seem to have much power. Well, think about it though. You're sitting here, and you could make yourself absolutely miserable or make yourself very happy just by the attitude you decide to adopt. And you have habits that are unskillful. You can change those habits. There is that element of freedom, there's that element of totally new input into the process, right here, right now. So what are you putting in? Try to put in the intention to understand the mind, understand its actions. And the best way to do that is to get the mind still so you can watch.
and see what you can make out of the potentials that are here. There's that passage where the Buddha talks about the potentials for the different factors for awakening. He doesn't get very specific. In some cases he said there's a potential for a rapture, or there's the potential for equanimity, or potential for stillness. Now, in some cases you can figure out what they are from other passages in the canon, like the potential for stillness. You try to bring the mind to the establishings of mindfulness. But in other cases, it's, it's up to you to find out where those potentials are. But the fact that he reminds you they are there, that's important. I mean, you keep that in mind. So even when your defilements are roaring in your ears and churning up your stomach, don't let them have everything. You have the power to make a change. So there's some place in you right now where there is a potential for stillness. Some place in the mind, some place in the body. And John Lee likes to focus attention on the spot where the diaphragm meets with the breastbone. Of course, that's right next to your heart, which may be pounding. But it's not strange that there are quiet spots right next to active spots. But wherever you find there's an opportunity for stillness. I know a woman one time who said no matter where she focused in her body to be aware of the breath, it seemed like she would mess up the breath energy, except for one spot, which is the base of the spine. To find a spot that's still. There's a potential there. And then bring what the Buddha calls appropriate attention to that. In other words, try to figure out where it fits in the scheme of the Four Noble Truths. What's going on in the mind? There are things that he said that you want to see as inconstant, stressful, not self. Well, a lot of your thoughts are just that. He says, learn to see them as alien and emptiness. To take some of their heavy reality away. And at the same time, you want to develop factors of the path. So which factors are you able to put together right now? As long as you can hold on to a right view. You've got the potential right there. That becomes the potential for right resolve. Right resolve becomes the potential for right speech and on down the line. Which may be one of the reasons why when the Buddha was talking about the power of the mind at death, he focused on right view. As long as you hold on to that, you're safe. Because that will alert you to the potential. So of the fact that you should be looking for the potentials, and you just don't give up. Because that's a really sad thing. People, when they get really exhausted, aging, illness, and death come and they drag them down, and they just throw in the towel. You should always be confident there's something you can do. There's a passage in the canon where two old Brahmins, 120 years old, come to see the Buddha. And they say, you know, we've never done anything meritorious in our lives. And the Buddha says, quick, do something meritorious. Give something away. Do something. Don't just complain. The Forest of Johns make a lot of this. There is no right complaining in the path. Because what is complaining is basically giving up, saying, well, there's nothing I can do. I'm just going to sit here and moan about what I don't like. There's always a potential someplace. Try to find what goodness you can in the mind, what goodness you can find in the body, and see what you can do to make the most of it. The potentials are there. Think of a John Lee with the breath. 
he had learned a little bit about the breath when he was in India, the breath energies in the body. But it was when he was really cornered, he was up in the jungle, northern Thailand. He had walked three days into this spot, he was going to spend the range retreat there. And shortly after he arrived, he had a heart attack. He had no medicine, there was no doctor. The only way he was going to survive was if he could pull himself together and to the point where he could have the strength to walk out for another three days at the end of the rains. As he explains it in a, his version of a story that comes from the commentary about a man who was condemned to death. In that case, the man said, well, when people die, where do they die? They die right at the breath. So he focused on the breath. That's basically what a John Lee did. He was going to die because his breath was going to run out. What could he do to make sure the breath didn't run out? Run out? What could he do to make the most of it? And he ended up finding this method that we've been practicing, working with the breath energies. He was able to pull himself together. And at the end of the rains, was able to walk out of the jungle. So the breath may not seem promising, just in, out, in, out. In fact, one of his fellow John's question about this is, what is there to see in the breath? There's nothing but in and out. And as John Lee said, if that's all you see, then that's all there is. But it's not all there is. If you hold in mind the possibility there's more to it, you'll find that there is. Don't let your confining views keep you confined. You'll have to learn how to step out of them. That's some of the mystery of the present moment. Not everything in the present moment is determined by the past. You have to have some input from the mind right now. You're looking at the dependent core rising. The intentions of the present moment come prior to sensory contact. Now, sensory contact, as the Buddha said, is old karma coming at you. You actually experience your present karma before you experience your past karma. But we pay so little attention to it because we're more interested in the things coming into the senses. We don't really realize what we're contributing. So, I'm trying to gain a sense of what you're bringing. You have some preconceived notions, you have some perceptions, you have some intentions. Air them out, open them up. Think of the Buddha and then he was awakening. He could have fallen in line with what everybody else had done with that knowledge. But he asked a question from a different angle. And when he asked the obvious question, if, if action is what makes a difference, then focus on action. If the way you pay attention makes a difference, focus on the way you pay attention. Try to get down to the nuts and bolts of how the mind puts experience together. And you find that you can put something really good together with those nuts and bolts. You can put the whole path. You've been fabricating the, your experience all the way up to now. Try to fabricate it so that it fits in with the different factors of the path. And remember that right view is not just seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths or knowing their duties. But it's also remembering that the whole purpose of this is to find the deathless. That's your motivation. That's right motivation is implied there. Just as the Buddha in the night of his awakening is because he kept his motivation in line with his original motivation, which was to find what was not going to age, grow ill, or die. That's how he got past that 
trap that had trapped other people at the, with that knowledge. In the same way, you're here because you've been suffering and you want to find a way out. And being convinced that there is a way out opens the possibility. If you're convinced that there's no way out, then there's nothing you're going to do. You're trapped. You're trapping yourself. But if you convince us the way out, it opens the possibility that you'll find it. And there are many people gone before you and say, yeah, there is. So it's there to be found. <laughs>